Hello, Daniel. Hello. This is episode three. Episode three. Of the Friend Plus Friend podcast. So my first episode was with Henry, which you met, you know. My second episode was with one of my friends who I've known for a long time, 79. He's a family friend, but we uh, we got pretty close like a couple years ago when I was like in and out of school. And he invited me to, like he, he had a vacation sort of home in Sotus. So I'd help him with like manual labor stuff with his vacation house. But anyway, so yeah, this is episode three, and it's a very casual conversation. I was gonna say, um, I've been telling people, I'm like, yeah, I was invited to be on a podcast. So like a podcast. I'm like, well, I don't think it's that big of a podcast no. right now. Um, like, well, what's the podcast about? And I'm like, huh, I think it's about human conversation. Yeah, so my initial, so I was on a podcast last month yeah. with a music friend of mine, and that was more specifically geared towards me as a musician, and I enjoyed the process, and then I thought, oh, maybe I want to try being on the other side, like being an interviewer, because sure. I've always sort of enjoyed you know, asking questions, and... I've always liked having like good conversations and I thought, oh, I could just start with my friends. And then I had this idea of like maybe eventually branching out to like acquaintances and then strangers, but I don't know if this will actually go anywhere because music's the primary focus. This is just like, oh, I'll do it when I have time. Right. But I've enjoyed, I don't know if, so I sent you the link this morning. I don't know if you got to sift through it, but I did. I've enjoyed yeah. sort of sifting through going back to the conversation looking for the, the short bits that are sort of unique like i thought john had some very interesting things like he, he's very like i don't know if you're into this stuff but he has a sort of a spiritual bent to him he's yeah. pondered sort of like philosophy and life a lot whereas like if you saw some of henry's clips like henry was much more like anecdotal he was trying to tell more stories about his life and as you as you can see like john had a lot more shorts yeah. not that henry not that my conversation with henry wasn't good or anything it was just a different sort of conversation right. so that made me realize it's very interesting looking back at those conversations because you don't really think about it too much but like every sort of the conversational styles of your friends and everybody is very different and like when you talk with them for a long time you sort of get a vague idea of like kind of what goes on in their head or what they think about right so the first question that i asked them which i suppose i'll ask you very open-ended very kind of cliche who is daniel welsh <laughs> That's probably one of the hardest questions you could ask a person. Henry was very nervous. He, he was sort of stammering. He didn't oh, know how to answer literally it. literally tweaking. Um, who is Danny Welch? You know, that's, it is a funny question because it's like, is that a question anybody asks themselves? Like, who am I? Have you ever asked yourself that? John and I actually talked about that a little bit in a podcast. and It hit the podcast with him and he was sort of saying, like, I don't really know who I am. Yeah. When I think about it and such. But typically, so a lot of people, you know, when you meet a stranger, right? They'll, a lot of the, like the initial questions they'll ask are like, what do you do? Tell me about yourself. A lot of it's like work related, but it's very open ended. Like one of my closest friends, Jonathan, um, who I met at school, like the first thing he told, or he asked me was, what's your story? And I was like, whoa. <laughs> what's that story? Well, chapter one, right? So I suppose I could sort of lead into it a little bit. So like, I could sort of nudge you in a certain direction. So we met at Wegmans. You right. just got promoted. Yeah. So you're a, you're, a, you're a department team leader. Right. I guess that's a part of you. It is, but, but it's not who it's I not, am. Yeah, perhaps it's not a very... I guess... I'm a goofball who's like Daniel that. Welch, you know? I think it feels like sometimes I'm somebody else for everybody who meets me, you know? Mm. it's It was really like, I think the word I would use is endearing. Like when we went out to dinner and you're just kind of giving your impression of who I am. And, um, you know, I... I it was really nice to hear. And then I thought to myself, I wonder what my other friends think of me because thinking of like my childhood best friends, like my core group of friends who I grew up with, mm -hmm. spent countless nights with after school, sleepovers, 
doing whatever, laughing over the dumbest things, whatever. I think to them now, even today, like they just think of me like a, a class clown. And then I started thinking to myself like, I wonder how many times they've really seen like a serious side of me where I feel like maybe you have gotten to see some of that more, whether that's because of work, where I yeah. have to sometimes not be as goofy, though I still think that's, like, true to my being. So, like, I still like to have fun. I want to make people laugh. You know, I, I get a lot of self-pleasure from that, I guess. Um, who am I? I... I, th I like to think that I'm a nice person person i don't think i'm perfect nobody ever really does think they're perfect i guess but i think a important aspect of myself that i try to live by is kind of like to be patient with everybody and to give everyone space to be themselves i think that's what i'm genuine generally best at and what kind of like it's a character trait of myself is just I'm really I go with the flow I try not to take things too personally and the only time I ever found myself taking things too personally is I think if I formed like an emotional attachment to that individual where I begin to care beyond what is probably my responsibility to care for if that makes any sense I don't I don't really know who I am I think I'm discovering myself day to day, year to year. What's something you, what's a, something very important that you feel like you've learned about yourself within the last year or two? I don't know if there's anything that stands out about what I've learned about myself in the last year or two. But I found that, especially through my work, that I'm discovering that I can lead a group of people. I was going to sing that. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm learning that I, I do possess leadership qualities that I didn't quite have when I was younger. But I didn't, I guess when I was younger, especially like thinking about in school or around my group of friends, like... It wasn't, a, it wasn't a requirement that I was a leader, per se. So I, I guess it wouldn't ever feel like a responsibility, but I guess when put in a position where I need to lead, I found that it was a lot easier for me than I think I found through coworkers that sometimes struggle. You know, people who are in leadership positions, but I make observations of like, you're in this position to lead, but I don't think you've earned the respect of your team or co uh, coworkers where you're effectively doing so. <clears throat> but I guess through work, I've learned that like, that's, while it's a sad requirement to be a leader, not, it's not a requirement because these people hold their positions without being necessarily good at that. And then in the areas that they are good at is like, well, if we're talking financials, or like kind of doing all of that background responsibilities of, you know, the, the nitty gritties of running a department, running a, a bakery or whatever department, I guess. So I've worked in a lot of different areas. It's just like, they're really good at managing that, but they're not good at effectively communicating with their team. And in turn, they don't earn the respect. And to me, I guess what makes a good leader is somebody who can earn the respect of their team and Kind of build that camaraderie did you ever hear that quote i saw this somewhere about how the best leaders don't want to be leaders i don't think i've heard that quote but it sounds like the best leaders are the ones that you know intend to be leaders or that don't want to be leaders i noticed when i when i work with you that you do have a, yeah i was going to touch on your leadership qualities but it's in a very it's not like unconventional per se but you lead in a very uh like everyone's sort of you don't lead in an authoritative way i feel like it's an inclusion it's a very inclusive sense and that actually does sort of lead me to this question so the podcast is sort of centered around friendships but like initially at least that was the idea 
and I've asked John and Henry this, um, or similar form of this question. So what is your perspective on friendships and relationships? Or maybe to be more specific, what do you think makes a good friend? Or maybe not even friend, just makes a good, what makes a good, yeah, sure. What makes a good friend to you or coworker? I think that it's interesting. So I never really thought to myself, like, what makes a good friend? Like, I feel like it's such a natural occurrence. Or it's very natural. Person, it is, yeah. you know, so like, like it's at a work. Vibe, you vibe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it is like feeling out the vibe. But at work, for me, it's kind of like I want to treat everybody like a friend. Yeah. I think that is also kind of touching on the leadership piece I think that's important to a leader is like for me it's just it comes naturally where it's just like you know if I'm ever in an environment or in a group of people whatever and I'm being a manager I don't want to make it feel as though if we're talking that so and so in the background is just a background mm -hmm person so while i think it's natural and normal to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation in in a kind of like a work setting and have somebody in the background i think i'm good at picking up eventually that like okay how can i bring that person into the conversation make them feel included because yeah. i think just working with a lot of people i learned in a non-leadership position that I get, I hear like, you know, you know, people like to complain and it's just like, yeah. oh man, so-and-so they're, they're playing favoritism and you know, they point out all their personal observations of why they feel that way. And a lot of times it's just like, okay, well, clearly that manager is just gravitating towards the person that they like more than anyone else. So you see them laughing or having conversations, but it's not reciprocal. Um, and I guess I like, I naturally feel bad for those that feel left out. Did you have an experience? So I feel like you and I are similar in a sense. Like, it seems like because your your inclusionary style, it's not. It doesn't seem. It seems very natural. Yeah. It's not something you really try. It's just like it's part of your it feels, nature. Sometimes or it feels it's, like an intuitive feeling too. Yeah. You know. So that actually does lead me to a question. Did you have an experience or experiences when you were younger that you think sort of? molded you into that sort of person because when I because I like I said I can sort of relate to you in that sense but I, can, I think I can sort of point to certain experiences from my past that maybe pushed me to that kind of style I can think of certain occasions it's weird but like so when my parents divorced at a young age um, my dad kind of found another partner um, who had a stepson sorry had a son who basically became my dad's stepson um to he was basically turned into my stepbrother yeah. and so we would often go to events that were on my stepmother's side of the family mm -hmm. where he was hanging out with his cousins and whomever and i i felt like the black sheep i felt like the the background person mm -hmm. And I think it was a weird like social anxiety on my end where I wasn't really willing to rise above and include myself. And, mm. I, and I think I probably honestly created situations where I wasn't allowing them to necessarily include me. But when I think about it, basically my experience was that I wasn't included, which is yeah. really interesting because in school, I felt like I was everyone's friend, you know, I wasn't like, I'm the popular kid, but I felt like I probably was leaning towards the popular one, but I think that's just because I was the goofball. I was the class clown. I was kind of like, I just wanted to be everyone's friend, and I felt that naturally a lot of people gravitated towards me to be my friend as well. So that kind of like ties back into your question of like, what makes a good friend? And it's like, I feel like what makes a sense good friend is <laughs> a sense of humor, but somebody yeah. that makes you feel good. Yeah. And making you feel good doesn't have to necessarily be because they make you laugh. It could be because they're kind to you, um, because you can vibe, but you just feel that natural, like, 
pull towards them where it's just like, I'm comfortable around you. I think you bring something positive to my life, whether that's big or small. I think some people gravitate towards friends because it's a, a giving situation, whether that is... I have a friend who buys me dinner all the time and that's why we're friends. Like, it seems really shallow, but like for some people that's what makes a friend. I, I, you know, I don't know what really makes a friend because for everybody, what they define as a friend is unique. Well, I'm, I'm curious, like think about your closest friends and is there a connecting thread to your clo- with your closest I think friends? it is our humor. It's a, this is a similar sense of humor. I think mm. at least there's high school, middle school, because I still have mm. friends that are yes. my friends even from then and it's like, our, our sense of humor is the same, you know, we we all gravitated towards the same interests, video games. Uh, we used to love, like, Adult Swim, Tim and Eric, that, right? you know, it was just like, that was kind of where we drew inspiration for the quirky humor that we had, and, like, just a lot of shared activities, you know, we like playing Magic the Gathering, it's a card game, and, like, we spent a lot of time doing that and just laughing over really silly things. And it's just like, to this day, like, to like, kind of like what I was saying is like those friends, they still only like, they see me as that. So I feel like if they were to watch this now, they'd be like, that's a side of Daniel. I don't, I don't really see too often because it's, see it. <laughs> you know, cause we're spending so much time just like, mm. I'm way more loose. Like, I don't, I don't care what they think. Cause they know me to this mm-hmm. point where it's just like, I like to be goofy. I don't want to be serious all the time. Mm. I know when to be serious. I think most people generally do, but you know, it's it, it's interesting. Have you been like? Do you have a shared vulnerability with them? Where like, that's the thing is, I don't think I do, and I think that's what makes it unique. Is like my core friends that I grew up with. They've never really, not to say they've never, but. I don't think they've seen me vulnerable too often. And I don't think it's because I'm uncomfortable showing vulnerability to them. I just don't think we have fostered a foundation for vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Have my close friends had some bad experiences that they've shared with us as a group? Because we have like a group chat. Like, sure, but it's few and far between. And I don't recall very often going into deep personal Mm. hard conversations with them i'm sure we've had them but it it's so few and far between because i don't think any of us have fought like created that comfort to be like that i'm not really sure so i'm curious because i was thinking about a couple of friends that i've been friends with since high school right and i was reflecting on how our friendship now still actually seems like the friendship we had in high school. Like you can, is that similar for you with that group that you yeah. had? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's like, you don't let, let go of that because that's, I think when the friendship was formed, you know? Yeah. So it's in kind of a, a stage of a, like, it's no longer progressing or it's not regressing. It's just in a sort of idle state in some ways. Not, not in a negative sense, but it's just kind of like, it's already established, so it's just kind of static. It's maybe. like a, yeah, it's like it's a, a static aesthetic. comfortability yeah. that it's just like, this is how we've known each other, and like, it kind of just sits there. So, is there somebody in your life who, like, friend in your life, or, I don't know, your partner, is there somebody who, like, does somebody come to mind when you think about, like, if you were to have just, like, if you're having a really bad day or something really bad has happened to you, and you just gotta like call somebody up and just bear your heart. Is there somebody that comes to mind that you feel comfortable enough going to? Or do you have a go to person? Maybe that's a better better question. I don't think I do. And I don't think that's because I don't think anybody can give me what I'm looking for. Yeah. I sometimes wonder if that's just because I internalize way too much do i think that i have a hard life or that like woe is me not not really um have i had tough circumstances arise absolutely so i guess if i would confide in anybody it'd be my mom but even that i don't 
I don't go to her often to dump on her. Yeah. I don't really go to many people often to dump on them, but I, I think I've gotten to a point in my life where I'm just kind of like, I think I've just figured out how to process and cope independently. Mm, that's very good. Yeah, very helpful. Um, so I, I think I'm comfortable going to most people if the topic arises in such a way where I'm just like, yeah, speaking of like this and this is happening now, I don't think, like, I don't think I'd be uncomfortable talking to you yeah, about it, you yeah. know? You I'm, also, go ahead. Sorry. I don't know, that, I mean, I just, it's easy for me to find enough levels of comfort with mm -hmm. people. Um, I can kind of gauge their capacity to support it. Yeah, yeah. And to wherever I feel like they can support is about how much I'll give. And I, I don't know, I, I think I can read people well enough to be like, okay, like, maybe I'm oversharing, like, they don't have enough space yes. to support that. So, like, yes. okay, we'll stop and just move on to whatever else, you know? Like, I don't think I've ever felt like I need to make it anybody's job to help me, per se. But I think it is natural, like, if you're having a bad day and it just, the first person that you're at least somewhat comfortable with is just, like, you just, it's on your mind, it's easy to share it. We went to Olive Garden, and, you know, you've had that instance at work, and you just kind of, like... Olive Garden. I'm sorry, Olive Garden. A cheesecake. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've never been to Olive Garden. This is the meetup with We're Henry. never going to yeah, Olive no, we're Garden. Not. This um, is the uh, meetup with Henry, like, a few weeks. A few yeah, weeks and, you know, you had that thing with work, and it's just, like, I could I could tell oh, that yes. yeah, it was bothering you, and you weren't yeah. shy at all to just kind of dump that on me, yeah. which was fine. I You know, but it just, like... I felt like in the moment, like, it just made sense for you to just, like, well, I have to get this out. I have an observation, too, where, like, I am, so, a, a basketball coach once told me that my, he once said, you know, Brian, your problem is that you wear your heart in your sleeve. Yeah. But I've noticed you are very, you've always struck me as a very composed person who, I mean, who doesn't seem very, what's the word, like, over, like, emotional, in a sense, of, at least on the surface yeah like whereas me i've you know i've been kind of extreme you know I've, i mean in, yeah in the past i've i've made a lot of like very emotionally driven decisions and maybe i seem composed like maybe i like at work and such but there have been so many times where i've just like i'm just spiraling but like you you've always struck me as someone who's like even quite even keel and so it doesn't surprise me that you say like like you couldn't think about think of somebody who necessarily you'd feel comfortable because it just struck me that maybe you've just never been in such like a crisis or like you, <laughs> you know, a space where you like you just need somebody to you know just dump on because you've just always been so composed you know yeah i mean sometimes it feels like that i i would also like to say and, and it's uh, fortunate to me that like bad things don't happen that often to me per se like would I love to be richer? Sure. Am I paycheck to paycheck? No. Would I love a house? Sure. But it's like those like wants don't put me down enough where I can still go day to day and just be like, you know what? Try to find the positives. It's like I, I can take care of myself. I can pay my bills. I don't have any pressing medical concerns that I, you know, I'm probably a hypochondriac, so when there are times that I don't feel good, I obsess on it, and I'm like, I'm dying. But, like, that's about the extreme end of, like, when I need to, like, dump on something. I'm like, I've got a lump on the back of my neck. This is the this is my last week to live. Like, <laughs> I can get, like, anxious in my head over things yeah. like that, but, like, you know, life's not terrible. We could go into the, you know, my opinions on my country or state of politics i have a very negative outlook but like when it comes to my day-to-day -day going through the motions i don't i don't feel like overly depressed i'm not overly ecstatic or happy i just kind of like take it as it comes what do you think is your most productive coping mechanism i don't know if it's necessarily productive or your most but it's music i mean that's, yes it's huge and like i do spend a lot of time listening to music you listen to all sorts of music I'm all over the place with it, you know, it's just something that I'm very passionate about, and like, 
sometimes I feel like a phony because I tell people I love music and all that, and I like I don't I don't have much to show for it from like a can I sing? Sure. Am I incredible at it? Good at it? Subjective. I don't know if I'm overly confident to show people per se. Like, I think I could round you as just like for fun, but like, I'm not musically talented. I don't perceive myself as that. As that. What I feel like I might be talented at is I, I think I have a good ear for it. Um, but I think that's subjective too, because there's so much stuff that I'm like, this is good music. And I show somebody else and they're like, that's trash. I love Taylor Swift or whatever. And then it's like, okay, well, we can go into the whole, like, well, I don't, I think Taylor Swift's incredibly talented. I, you know, and I mean, she's a poor example, but it's just like, <laughs> it's not my cup of tea and it's not what I perceive as like, that's good music, but like, who's, who's to say, you know, what are you listening for when you're judging whether or not a song to you is like good or not? What are you looking for? Is just, just, it's a feeling. A it's it's a, a feeling. feeling. Sometimes know? that's just what it is. It's just a feeling. Like, from a creator standpoint, like, when I'm writing something, I, I really just judge it based on feeling. Like, does it feel good? Like, I don't no, know how yeah, to like, does, does it feel, feel like there's some something deep? Like, some soul? It's hard to describe, but, yeah. Sometimes that's just all it needs to be. Just, your, it's in your intuitive yeah. sense. And that, and that's what makes it so, like, interesting like i have a lot of friends who love music that i personally i think they have like a good judgment on what is good or i guess we share mm -hmm. similarities commonalities and like what we listen to what we like so like i find validation through them because like i respect their taste in music i bring music to their plate and they're just like that's incredible vice versa and then I, go, I share music with other people and they're just like, what the hell are you listening to? And I'm just like, I don't know. Sounds good to me. You know, it's, it's, I don't know, it's weird. I, okay, so this is a strange thing about me. When it comes to me listening to music by myself, I have a very narrow preference. Like a very, I go back to the same stuff that I essentially was liked in middle school, high school. But when I'm with somebody else, like if I'm riding in the car with somebody else, or I'm with somebody else, and they, I essentially, like, play whatever you want, but I listen differently, depending on the context. So when I'm by myself, I just want something, when I'm driving, I just want something familiar that's sort of, like, easy, to, very listenable. But when I'm, like, if I'm, someone else is driving, or in the car, or, like, I'm in there, hanging out with them, and they put something on, I listen, I, I listen intentionally, and I'm very receptive to, like, whatever. Because, it's a, it's a weird thing, I don't know how to describe, I don't know how to necessarily explain the reason behind this but do you think it's because it's like an alternative way of getting to know the person you're spending time with? i think it might be and really like that it this like yeah they listen to this because like the, like for example i like a lot of rap music do mm -hmm. i come off as somebody who probably likes a lot of rap music no have i surprised people by some of the stuff i listen to they're like i would have never saw that coming and i'm like mm -hmm. But I love it. I can't help it. It's what makes me, yeah. like, it resonates with me. Not lyrically, per se, but, like... Something about it. But it's the beat, you know, it's just... It's the mood. It's the mood. Yeah, because music know? is more than just, like, the lyrics are important, the melody, but music is also just, yeah, like, just some energy, just some... It's just... It's, it's a vibe that... It's not something you can really quantify or put into words sometimes. Yeah. Like, you just... You judge it based on how it makes you feel in that moment. But it's something, like, even at work, when I'm... You know, getting to know coworkers, my team members, I go to a new location to work with whoever. Like, those are some of the first questions I ask to get to know them. It's what yeah, music feels it, to Because I feel like it tells tells you a bit about somebody. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually true. It's, what, it's maybe cliche, but it's true. And everybody pretty much listens to music. So everyone, well, not everyone loves music, but music is ubiquitous in a sense. Yeah. Um... Oh, I had a question. So, so I wanted to point out like an interesting thing. So during COVID, I got very deep into music production, and suddenly I was listening to. Like it wasn't totally left field, but I was listening to like music styles that I wasn't, that I wouldn't typically listen to. And I was listening to albums front to back, okay. and like. Even like, like Keith, you know, he recommended me this album by Under Oath, yeah. and, you, you, and I and I listened sure to it front to back. Yeah. 
because I was just like, oh, I was in this this mood, this mode of I want to improve as a producer. Mm-hmm. So and so to do this, I want to listen to different things. Yeah, you know, because because it's a lot that are, that's hidden in songs that like you might you gotta really intentionally listen. It's how you draw inspiration. Yeah, you know? and by yeah. listening to the, and like before that, like I had rarely it had been so many years since I listened to an album front to back. I don't even remember when the last time before that I listened to an album like literally top to bottom. Yeah, and then I also realized how hard it is to be fully attentive when listening to an album front to back. Well, not every song is really good. There's a lot of artists I yeah. love, and I go and I like try and try their new album out, and like you just keep hitting duds. And I'm like, I really like this person, but like I'm not required to like every song, and you yeah. can't make yourself like every song. So sometimes yeah. for me, it's hard to do that because I'm just. Yeah. Like so bad, so badly. I just want to skip. Like, yeah, it did help me in in terms of because well, because I eventually made a couple albums and it sort of helped me figure out like how I wanted to create the album because some people are very intentional about when they make an album, they there's a it's conceptual there's like an arc, but then like maybe in like pop music for example, or some artists are just like we're just gonna pick the best songs like individually yeah. like it doesn't necessarily have to be this like storyline it's just yeah, right. best songs and we figure out like oh how they how do they space out and such and then you just realize oh it doesn't really matter how <laughs> like it doesn't really matter yeah. how the albums put together or that you just sort of you make it however you please and then it is what it is sometimes wish artists there was like a way for them to like tell us how to listen to their album because kind of like what you said like i think of a like a rapper kendrick lamar he had an album where it's like it's meant to be listened from top to bottom but then it's also meant to be listened from bottom to top and they tell he said that yeah like he was it was like it tells two different stories wow if you listen to it depending on which direction you go and it's just like a lot deeper than some albums other albums from other artists are can be but like you don't really know it until you like either a like look for that or i just always thought albums were meant to be listened to from like one to twelve or whatever you're talking about them in a sense but sometimes i don't think artists i think it's more of just meant it's also just like a package like it's just it's just a thing artists do they release albums so they can so they have this body of work that they can tour with yeah you know like for example like a band i love or that I loved growing up, One Republic, like they're huge in pop. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I thought their first couple albums were really, really interesting lyrically, but but then as they've gotten along, they've they've sort of I think tried to follow the whatever pop sort of trend or whatever the pop standards are mm-hmm. lyrically. And I was like listening to their most recent record like last year, and all of them like were singles and isn't like all of them were were good songs, but. It just felt like a collection of songs where it, it didn't really, you know, some indie artists, like the, it feels more like a, just like an album, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, and that's why I'm like, man, I wish we had a little bit more backstory. Should I be looking for a theme here? Do they want me to discover that theme on my yeah. own? And every album is different depending on the artist because yeah, yeah, sometimes it's literally just a collection of their work from the last yeah, year, which, which is fine. Like it's it the is best. Fine. Like, yeah, I think yeah, like yeah. Edge, Ed Sheeran. I think he was. I think he had this approach with a lot of his early records where he was just he writes, writes like two hundred songs for an album and you just you pick the best ones, what you think are the best ones for the album and whatever that means. Does he really like write that many songs? Yeah, Ed, just, yeah, he, he yeah. I believe it. Ed, he, I think he writes. I think he's. I saw him recently in an interview. He. Like he clocks the studio ten to five every day, and yeah, so he's I think per month he's writing at least. He's getting to how much he can probably get two hundred songs a month. He he's a fast writer. Did you see? He's a very fast writer. I don't really listen to him. Never really have. But uh, Mac DeMarco, I think, yeah, put out I, an really album in DeMarco. the last year. I would say, and it, it's something like it's two parts, but it's like a hundred songs or something. Jeez. A lot of them are like just short jam sash type. Yeah. Thing. A lot of them aren't very constructive. Yeah. But like, but it makes me think of like similar in the sense of like the guy just lives and breathes just writing music. Like. Yeah. He just took. He's just like I don't want to cherry pick. I'm just gonna give you everything I've written in the last, whatever. <laughs> well, like Mac, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's different from every artist. Yeah. There's a kind of a 
a beauty to that. Like an artist that I been influenced by a lot, like Passenger. Like he's re he's like released an album every year for the last like decade, but it's all very cohesive and his sounds stay very consistent. And it, they always, I think most of the recent albums have always been ten songs. Okay. So he's not doing this like. I don't know if he necessarily goes in with a concept. He's just, it's just, he kind of just, I think, wherever, how many ever songs he writes in that period of time, and whenever he feels like he's, it's time to make an album, he just records it. It just feels right. Yeah. Well, I think Whereas, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, like I, me personally, I was like, oh, it would be nice if he, like, like as a fan, like I like, of course I like his sound, I always will, but it would also be cool if he made a record that was very different from what he typically writes and that maybe that lyrically would be different and such, but, but from his perspective, it's probably like, no, I'm just writing what feels good. Yeah. And what I like, if I think the song is good, I think it's album worthy and it's going to be on the album. Like I don't need to write 50, 60 songs. I just write, I write 10, 12 songs. And then if I feel like I have 10 good ones. That's it. We'll flush it out. You know, we'll, we'll... I feel like it's so challenging for a lot of artists too, because it's like you change your sound up too much. You've just, made a bunch of your fans angry or you've lost fans or so. I, I can think of some bands that have kind of done that and it's just completely like stopped making like it just stopped being what I enjoyed about that artist I think of like Bon Iver I love his first I don't think I think he's go ahead bon I just think he's switched up his sound a lot which is I think it's which some people love yeah that. I will see I'm he not lost I lost the appeal so for it, it was, rather than do it for me, you know? Like, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. he's doing what he wants to do as yeah. artist. And I would never want to be like, you're wrong for that. Like, that's art yeah. is subjective. Music's subjective. It's like, that's what he wants yeah. to do. That's what he's mm -hmm. influenced to be. Maybe he hated his original sound and was just like, that's not what I want to be anymore. Like, and that's fine. It's just, but it's like risky because. Because you do alienate some listeners. And, yeah. uh, and a lot of bands have done that for yeah. me. But I don't expect them to cater to my wants. They don't yeah. know me. So I'm like, whatever. Yeah, but. Bon Iver. So I listened to Bon Iver pretty extensively during like, COVID. I, I remember listening to his first record. That's some good COVID back. music. That's some isolation music. But, but, well, uh, yeah, but I also remember I listened to his album 22 and Million front to back. And I was, because gotcha. I, I was very curious about, because I had come from this acoustic singer sort of thing and I was in, going into producing. And I was curious, like, oh, what other things can you do? Or like, how, what other ways can you push yourself musically? And I was listening to him, like, wow, he doesn't seem to be following, like, any conventional structures. And, and then it made me realize, like, music is very much, like, there doesn't have to be any rules, per se. Unless you're under, like, a label as, who's, like... Yeah, it can, be, it can be as experimental right, as you want. Right, and, right. and, well, Justin's, I think, Bonnie Bear's progression, I think he always intended for it to be this way because he started solo, but I think it's in some interview he mentioned that he wanted it to just include more people and so i think his last record or the i i record or whatever it was called i think yeah, that yeah. like there was a song i remember new york times did a feature on the song where it had like 20 people involved like 20 different writers or producers or i think like every song yeah had a feature of sorts yeah, yeah but i think that's that's cool in a sense because different musicians they all bring something different to the table yeah. and like when you come together it's it's not the same as if you were just by yourself so that's kind of cool i think too it came from like i think he he became mm -hmm confident and mature yeah. into his music that yeah. like he's what well, he's very capable and able to do do that and he's already established exactly yeah. so that's the thing too i wonder too because when artists get to a certain point where they're established or where they're content yeah. with where they are then maybe they just don't they'll just they just make whatever they want to make which i think is ultimately yeah it is the best approach well, it's tricky too. The business side is tricky because, yes. for example, like there's an artist uh, I like. His name's James Bay. He's a singer songwriter who signed to a major label, and he his first record like blew up. Like he had Hold Back the this, I don't know if you've heard of this guy. He's a British singer songwriter. And he had a big song on the radio called Hold Back the River and Let It Go. It was like kind of like pop rock. Not the Frozen song. No. And that's Let It Snow. No, that's also Let It Go. Oh, no, it is Let It Go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'll play it for some other time. But anyway, so like his first album blew up like he won awards you know these two songs were like hits and he you know had big tours you know in america and europe yeah. <coughs> and then in his second album he sort of veered away from that sound and like the production style was different like all the songs on the record were like a lot of the songs on the record the production was quite different like they were mm -hmm. still poppy but he was obviously sort of like intentionally 
trying to like do something different with his sound right but that album flopped yeah. and like his momentum like it just plateaued and then it like was well, he's still like so he opened he's still pretty big like he opened for the lumineers he's still playing like pretty big venues in in europe but he's not like going to arenas in america and you know progressing like when ed sheeran did you know for yeah. example and and it's very hard maybe as artists to rebound when you like you're so successful initially and then you have an album that just it it just it, I wonder whether that like dumb. goes to their like their the self esteem or their ego too, you know. I feel like I don't know. I, I I guess it's different for artist to artist, but I feel like if my if I was riding a high of success and then I flopped, it probably would crush me. I guess it depends on uh your expectations. Yeah. I know it's very hard to, I've read so many interviews of artists and like a lot of ones who, you know, they have very successful like hit in the first album and, you know, a lot of them talk about the pressure of keeping it going. The, no, a lot of them talk about this realization that their like next piece of work probably won't be as big because that the thing that blew them up and they're trying to come to terms with it. Um, because at the end of the day, it's still very rare. It's very hard to just keep topping yeah. your previous like ed sheeran like he's a black sheep in some ways like he literally every album he put out like a plus multiply it just keeps it just kept getting bigger <laughs> except up, for his yeah. like his last like but he did mention like now he's sort of like he's sort of peak like you can't get any bigger than stadium sold out stadiums like even taylor's place like that's the biggest you can go so at that point just maintaining or like it doesn't really matter if you keep dipping because like you've already achieved the highest of the highs i feel like taylor's just the only artist right now who's like somehow finding a way to like <coughs> stay pe- she's like just stays peaked well coldplay is done like i was looking at their um their 2024 tour every show i think in their 2024 tour is sold out wow and they're all stadiums and they've been going for and they've been going for a long for 20 time. plus years coldplay some good crying music Older they coldplay. have <laughs> i am guilty because i like a lot of their songs i've covered a lot of their songs but i've only covered their hits like i've listened to some of their like lesser known songs but i must confess i haven't listened to there was an album like that wasn't super well known called Ghost Stories, which I dived into like in two thousand fifteen. It had Skyfold Stars on it, like, but it, they didn't tour with it. It was a very like underwhelming album in that sense, but like it didn't sell much because they didn't promote it that much. But I think Coldplay is incredible because so you know how Taylor Swift she, when she got sort of big, like she, it was because she had like the teenage audience. But mm-hmm. I feel like Coldplay's always had that more like universal. Yeah. Like family they're family friendly they also resonate with young folks but like older folks too i'm not, I'm not saying that taylor doesn't have a universal quality in her music right. but i always envision her family as like screaming girls screaming teenage girls you know but like with coldplay i think oh like everyone you know my mom loves yeah. it my grandma loves it my yeah. dad you know yeah it some people like hate like so i know we were, a lot of people that so hate so coldplay. i was so we were so henry and i and one of our friends we were at the spirit room like a couple months ago right. and it was karaoke night and I decided, I'm gonna, we're going to fix you. And then one of the bartenders was like, you need to turn that off right now. Like, I hate Coldplay. And she was like, offend- she seemed offended. <laughs> like, she seemed very, like, she really wanted that to be shut off. Like, there's something, I was like, geez, there's something like traumatic associated with, like, fix you, <laughs> like Coldplay. I don't know. I think, I don't know why people dump on them. I think Chris Martin, I think he's incredible. He's a freaking genius. Like, I think in a lot of ways. it's. And it's kind of like I said, yeah, I show simple. people music that I like and they, they do dump on it. And yeah. like, it's just accepting the fact that like, there's just a quality to it that just doesn't resonate. And I do yeah. think it makes it like, Coldplay not as much as like when I think of like Nickelback. Why there's like, that Nickelback so there's much? like this, the, the <laughs> meme aspect <laughs> of it, you know, and it's just like, now by default, you just are like, Oh yeah, I hate them. I don't even know I don't, why. At this I don't know point. why Nickelback gets hate. Did they, because it's I mean, not my cup of tea. I'll, I'm not gonna dude, tell when, you it is. When we like, were I don't go, care if you in like our it. teens, when I MTV, think it's kind of funny. <laughs> but when MTV was a thing, did you watch MTV growing up? Yeah. So like, I remember Nickelback. Like their songs were always on MTV, like Far Away, Saving Me, Photograph. I, yeah, but I love their songs. That was so catchy. <laughs> but I think people give them crap because they think they all sound the same or something. But or it's just like these like yeah. masculine like. The masculine voice singing like, about like a sensitive, soft subject. Bad rock or some sort. I don't even know. But I don't get it because I think music should just, in some ways, be appreciated as music. But maybe, yeah, people get so emotionally connected to certain like weird, like just whether or not artists like like I don't get why artists should get so much hate in that sense. Like, what did they do? <laughs> like, did they do something wrong? They're just existing. They offended someone. That's just like you know. 
maybe it's a, maybe it has to do with like a gender thing because maybe some like really masculine men were just like we don't like how these men are singing about these sensitive soft subjects, you know, in this way with this masculine voice, you know. I used to really hate the Beatles when I was young. Yeah. I don't even know why at this point. Yeah. But it was just like I told myself I hate them. I don't know why everyone loves them. Blah blah blah. blah. And I think it was, to me now, it was just because I was immature. Now when I'm like, now at my age, I'm like, I don't, I still don't, I don't like the Beatles. But like, when you think about it, same way I think about like Taylor Swift, I don't really like Taylor Swift. But I guess I grew up to a point where I'm just like, I don't care if you like Taylor Swift. I don't care if you love the Beatles. I don't really care what you like that's for you to enjoy. And like, I don't want to take that from anybody. And I still am able to recognize that, like, the, what the Beatles did for music today is they're considerably <coughs> one of the more modern-ish influentials of their generation. I think the defining group, yeah. they really kind of sh tilted the needle in the direction of where music went going from the 60s forward. Um, do I quite understand the mass appeal Taylor Swift has. I mean, I get to a degree I do, but, like, I just don't think she's heaven sent. But what's the matter what I think at this point, you know? It's, like, I love mm -hmm. that she is able to make so many people, like, yeah, excited, you know? Like, that's great that an artist has that yeah. effect on somebody. I don't quite feel that way myself, well, but I'm, am I required to? No. I mean, I think she writes relatable songs, and she has that, like, she's been big since we were very young. And it's been around so, so I think she's, so she's already had that foundation. Yeah. Like, there comes a certain point where an artist is so big that their clout is enough for, like, whereas anything they release just pops off because their clout is, yeah. is enough. Yeah. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Because I, I, I know, like, growing up, like, obviously she really resonated with the teenage audience and, like, all those love songs she was writing, like. She was just speaking what people were going through, I guess, and or at least what the masses are. Yeah, it's, it's relatable. But then again, like if you never identified with the quote unquote mass, like you never felt like you quite fit in, then maybe it makes sense why Taylor Swift isn't really your vibe because she doesn't really speak to you in that sense, like you know. Because yeah. in some ways, right, to be a big pop artist, you have to have mass appeal. And I'm not saying like all pop artists who have the mass appeal they necessarily fit in with the masses, but they. Hit on something that comes. And I think but. for me as a listener, like lyrics, I don't think have ever mattered to me. Yeah, so that's interesting too because people listen to music differently. Yeah, yeah, and for me, like I do like good lyrics, but I also realize like a good song doesn't necessarily need to have good lyrics, yeah. whatever that even means. Yeah. You know, you, people also overlook like instrumental music, and people don't talk about. Well, there's something about words. I think that. Well, the reason why, say, like, songs with words are more popular than instrumental because there's something about it that you can sort of maybe articulate in some way. I've met a lot of people who they they don't want anything to do with instrumental yes. music. Like, like like Keith, for example. I don't Keith isn't a big lyrics guy. Yeah. But. Yeah, I think it just depends on it's it's a lot has to do with like just maybe temp your temperament too, or whether or not you. You're like invest in your feeling <laughs> like i i've always kind of been like it's really over maybe even oversensitive like neurotic kind of person where like but maybe like i'm just very sensitive and so lyrics resonate with me like i've always like good lyrics or gravitate towards i, like, I mean sensitive music. i've listened to songs where you know the mixture of the vocals mm -hmm. the lyrics i I've, I've cried to music plenty yeah. of times But at the same time, there's a lot of stuff lyrically that I just, I don't even, it's almost like I'm just drowning it out. It's just there. I mean, I, I as somebody who likes to sing, I do like when I and like I can enjoy the vocals, but I don't even care what they're saying. It's just like, it's just as much as like you're playing the note, a note on the guitar or whatever, it's the the note they're singing, the, the it's energy in the voice. It's yeah. like, it's the feeling it's piece. It's what I'm either. feeling from even... You know, if I hear an artist hit even a certain note, I get that, like, 
euphoric yeah. tingles that flush my body. Yeah, no, but people, people like I, I remember I'd listen to songs on YouTube and people in the comments would say, "Oh, when he sang that line or that yeah. word, the way he yeah. sang that word gave me chills." <laughs> you know, and some people don't experience that at all. Yeah, no, I yeah. So I I noticed too when I was in that COVID period when I was listening to a bunch of albums and like front to back and I was listening to a lot of songs. I realized like like. When I was listening to a song, oh, there was a specific second in that song that, that was my favorite part. Like when he sang that note or when he changed chords, like that was the part of the song that made it, like, it just made that, it, that made it hit. something to listen to, <laughs> yeah. to wait for that part. Yeah. Like not because they had a great chorus, or, you know, but then some songs are just like, oh, you just wait for the, the chorus, you know, the whole, or it's just fast, it's just a vibe. To drive I even to. remember when I was a lot younger, I'd like set out U2, that was really where I listened or, or discovered a lot of music. And I would just keep clicking the part in the song, like, <laughs> just to basically rewind it. Yeah. And I would just play it on, like, repeat yeah. until I just couldn't take it anymore. Yeah, but that's what I would do with, like, if I discovered a new song I really liked, I would just, I repeat the whole song, like, the whole day, just that song. <laughs> that's I, I, that's me today. I mean, I, I, I find songs where I'm just, like, over and over and over again, and I'm sick of it, and then I probably won't listen to it again. And then I'm, like, looking for that next hit. I, I looked at it as, like, you just... You suck out all the emotion from the song, and then when you can't... Looking for that emotion all over again from the Yeah, then you just go find... It's like, probably, it's like a microcosm of probably what people do with other things, too. Like, maybe if somebody's always, like, dating somebody, (laughs) they just keep looking for that hit. I'm like a music (laughs) drug (laughs) addict. (laughs) I'm literally chasing that next high that music can give me, and that is something I, you know, to my taste in music, like, kind of like you said, you list... on your own time, you listen to a lot of things that you listened to when you're in middle school, high school, at a younger Sad age. Alex. I have a lot of friends who are the exact same way. They yeah. literally stick to what they know. And, like, to me, I'm like, I couldn't do that. I, yeah. Like, can I revisit songs of the past? Absolutely. But it just, it hits different. It doesn't hit in the way, like, my musical <coughs> tastes, I feel like, are continuously changing, mm-hmm. evolving devolving mm-hmm. like i don't know like sometimes i listen to things and i'm like this is very questionable of me but like it sounds good so yeah i don't care you know so what's, what's interesting is you know like i like listening to like you know, just sad ballads but then you know i made something like that seven eight thing that i sent you that yeah. thing and se- that was just kind of weird that was cool like but it, but it has nothing to it's not like anything i typically listen to but i also so it's kind of weird because on one hand like i like so as a creator, like, I like to listen to, like, stuff that's familiar. Yeah. But when it comes to, like, I do, like, with my singer song or anything, I do write a lot of, like, similar stuff to, like, what I listen to. But, like, when I was producing, like, in Logic and, like, with these electronics and sounds, I was, like, I, I was making stuff that eventually I was like, oh, maybe I'll, t- I'll take it. Like, this is stuff I haven't put out. Like, these instrumentals, I'll probably show you one of these days, like, some of these instrumentals where it just kind of, like, breaks, where, like, the song, I changed like genres like four times in the song. Like it just goes in a totally like weird. But it makes know? it fun. It makes it yeah. exciting for yeah. me. Like as a listener, like I I love that. Yeah, well, it's like unpredictability. But but the thing is, I realized to to I think for my music to be quote unquote accessible, like this is I'm talking like a business, like a yeah. like listenable. Like as John Mary said this word listenable. Like there has to be some sort of familiarity. I realized. So I think you can still have like both worlds like i can have my project where i make these like sensitive singer songwriter songs but then i can have like something that this other project where like for example with keith like we we don't make anything like terribly left field but this is something where i'm more like i'll just let it be whatever it needs to be like keith can direct it and i'm, I'm not gonna like nudge it in a direction like it can just go wherever it needs to be you know like like with the stuff that i the thing i showed you like i was just like who cares what it <laughs> like like it was literally like stream of consciousness like vocals everything was very just um, like I didn't think about it too much. I didn't, you know. So art and well, and also like, yeah. So like art and there's like a weird conflict between art and business aspect of it, as you know, I'm sure. Yeah. <coughs> Sometimes I wonder too. It's like I consider myself fairly like ADHD, like very somewhat scattered brain. So like I think that's also what drives like my musical interests as I you get bored. I, you get, I get bored, bored easily, but I like songs down. that just throw a lot of stimulus yeah. at me, you know. And, and I, that's not to say I do listen to some stuff that is very basic, mm-hmm. uh, you know, at a fundamental level, I guess. But like, 
like that song you sent me i genuinely enjoyed it because it was just and to me it didn't feel like it was all over the place but it just yeah. had moments it where had, it, it had, wasn't yeah, keeping it, it was keeping me like on edge in a yeah sense, so like yeah, i don't think it, it was in a yeah i don't think it was like so chaotic like i i you know there was like a you know there was a beat there was a tempo and then it sort of went off but then it would sort of come back to something yeah. but it was just it was it was a non-committal so like you yeah. couldn't commit to it it just did it you did your thing yeah and i thought that was good for me because it i think it it stretched my like boundaries a little bit because it, it shows you what you can do which you can do anything but well like, you can sort of like do whatever you want yeah. well so that's in one one aspect right where as a person who makes music like if you want to make a career out of it maybe you have to be more practical and be like okay how do i actually make money from this but then on the, just, if you're just thinking about it from a purely artistic standpoint like it doesn't really matter yeah. but like there's no way for me to perform that thing i sent you live like there's no like, like or i can just press play on a laptop you just and hit just, play and sit there <laughs> and just yeah. stare and you're yeah. just like yeah. <laughs> well, so because there is still something that I resonate that I I'm, maybe I romanticize like the idea of like I know it's kind of cliche like the the lone man or woman with the guitar on stage, you know, and just singing. But I still think there's something really powerful about the simplicity of somebody who can do that really well. Like just yeah. one instrument, no like you know like loop, no not no like bells and whistles, just like an instrument and a vocal. There's still something I think really powerful about somebody who can do that really well. And so I think that's something I, I do chase as a performer. Like, how do I create this moment? Because, you know, when you go to, like, mic nights, for example, like, you see so many of everyone, you know, so many people who play guitars, like, you know, sing. But, like, it's so, but it's, like, how do you, you know, stand out in a sense? It's, like, it's, it's a good challenge yourself. in some yeah. ways. But, like, I don't really think about it in that sense. Like, when I'm writing, it's just, like, when I write, I just, I'm gauging, like, does it feel somewhat fresh? Does it feel honest? And that's usually enough. But, Yeah. So you mentioned, um, like your dream job would be to do A and R, potentially. <coughs> Could you ever see yourself segueing into that if the opportunity came? I don't know what the opportunity would look like, and I don't know how I would ever even approach some such a thing. I've thought of like ideas of like, like trying to create like an underground platform of just like a label. I guess, but, like, just trying to, like, network people. Like, try and, like, find a way to involve, like, I like SoundCloud. I don't go on it as much as I used to, but, like, I find a lot of very low-visibility artists who just make, like, a beat they like. They upload it. They upload a ton of them, whatever. I find a few I like. And I guess, like, to me, like, an A&R is kind of, like, somebody who kind of is that segue to kind of network artists together and basically say, like, I think you have a sound that would work really well with them. And I, you know, you just kind of, like, sometimes in my brain, it's like being a matchmaker. Maybe a connector. You know? I feel like that way, too. I, wow, we're actually more similar than I realize. Like, I do feel like, I, I don't know if you have a desire to, be a connector but i do i do feel like somewhere in me I, I i there's a part of me that wants to bring people together is it because you you feel like you have a vision for potential that excites you like well, to, this, if you were to see it come to well, fruition this is not with like music but this is more like with like friendships like i want like certain my certain friend my friends to be friends with my friends yeah, <laughs> essentially yeah. or like or like i'm always trying to find a way to help somebody through a connection like i'm always thinking about, like if i meet someone new and they're talking to me and i'm like sort of subconscious or automatically thinking about like do i know somebody who would be interested in like what they're telling me and i don't know i don't know where that comes from or what it is exactly i have made that observation about you it's it is like for example like this is when um when i had arranged i think initially when i arranged my first meal with you i was like oh, oh i so want henry, henry to be right yeah i, I thought like you, you click so it's a I did this, like, for example, like, I was at Brewers the other day, and I had organized, I was organizing a lunch with Henry and Ashley, who was a high school class, we were in the same class together, and then I bumped into a classmate of mine who works at Brewers, and I hadn't seen him in, like, ten years, nine years, whatever, and then, I mean, I was like, oh, so we're having a l dinner on Sunday, you want, you're, you want to come, and so, like, it's just, yeah. like, instantaneous, yeah. like, and I've definitely gone overboard with that before, where, like, almost, like, two years ago when I was at school, I, uh, almost lost friends, well, we don't really talk much anymore, but. Like I 
screwed up really badly where like so this this friend of mine was hosting this function for like halloween but then also for like my friend's birthday who she wasn't that close with but i ended up inviting like 90 percent of the people so like 90 percent of the people there were like connected with me and she was really pissed because it felt like probably like my thing but she was hosting and she didn't she had you know done a lot of the food preparation it was at her place and i it was just miscommunication because i was just i wasn't trying to like slight her or anything i was just super excited about like Oh, like my friends want to meet each other and meet them, and everyone can be together. friends. Yeah. So, but then I realized she was just so ticked, and because I was like inviting people, and I had to go pick people up, and like I didn't know if this person was going to show, and it was just like. But I also had a realization. Well, I've had this realization for a long time, but that experience also made me realize or reinforce the idea of just actually I'm not. I've never been great in groups. I've always never really felt a sense of community anywhere per se. Because I've always like I've always felt a little like lone wolfy in plenty of sense. But I, at the same time, I also feel like I have an ability to connect with people and like bring people together, and like there's a desire in me to do that. But I've never really felt like a part of a group per se. How do you think that ties into your desire? to connect people is it like maybe that's where it comes from this feeling of like so i never really felt like a part of something so i so i want people to not have to feel that because it's a terrible feeling yeah. to feel like I, so you just want to bring people together so you can be the lone wolf who then watches them <laughs> connect <laughs> i'm just kidding yeah no I, it's like self-inflicted well, torture well it's strange I mean, you yeah. probably you can relate to this like you work with the you know you have a team that you work with mm-hmm. i have a team i work with and like I imagine you feel like you can connect with all of them, but maybe not all of them you feel like a deep resonance with. But here's the thing, yeah. though. This is the thing. Like, it doesn't really have to matter because. But for me, I've always realized I crave that deeper connection with people. But I don't think everybody does. Yeah, it's like, never I, gonna be mutual like, necessarily. Yeah, yeah. like, but I, so like, I've always like, I'm satisfied with with my interactions at work, but I also am like, there's always a yearning in me for something deeper. I don't know if you have that too. Like, like I wish we would have, like at work, I wish, you know, we would have more, like, not important, but more, like, just deeper conversations. I wish we'd all be a little bit less afraid to just be more honest and open, instead of always just, like, being kind of surfacey and... I feel like, yeah, work <coughs> is where you're going to see that the most, that, yeah, like, surfacey. Yeah. But I... You know, I've gotten a lot of mixed opinions on why that's sometimes a good thing and sometimes, you know, whatever. Yeah, not you know, everybody wants to hear like, Well, these... it sometimes could backfire. I mean, you okay. tell somebody too much and next thing you know, they're A, forming an opinion based yeah. off that tidbit or they're using that against you. But I also, yeah, you're right, but I've also noticed like when somebody shares something that is obviously pretty meaningful or pretty personal to them, I automatically feel like, oh sense of like oh wow they trusted me to Which to say it. And, I, and i felt like oh wow that's actually like something i should not take for granted yeah so so it's interesting we 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 sort of went on a, well we didn't go on a tangent but <laughs> I, I i i do want to ask you um what do you think were some or we can talk about one experience or two if you can think of them you think of a positive and negative experience that you had growing up that was very impactful for you that you think sort of shaped a lot of your views on things or or maybe just instances that stick out to you just like, like maybe a really good memory or something a struggle that or maybe it's just a not so good memory that a challenge that you had that you went through that you feel like are they kind of not defined but they're kind of you know, I feel like they have you know, things that probably shaped me in some capacity, some way. Um, I mean, some things that stick out that are more like, I guess, traumatic for me and the younger age is kind of like, you know, thinking on it then as a kid, it didn't seem to impact me. I don't remember having any like cares towards it. But, like when my parents divorced when I was like four years old, being four years old, I don't even hardly remember that time of my life, but like reflecting on the pure idea of like being in a split household i'm sure it impacted me i don't <coughs> quite think 
positively, though I think it definitely allowed me to become stronger in certain areas that maybe could be con considered positive today. I mean, it, it shaped me into who I am today. Um, but I could even think of like, you know, due to growing up, basically two divorced parents, I spent a lot of my childhood kind of being passed around both sides of the family um, due to like my mom's work schedule. So like I'd spend a lot of time with my grandmas, both grandmas, my mom's side and my dad's side, uh, and my great grandma, um, more, uh, specifically on my dad's side. Um, and my great grandmother, she was a single room schoolhouse teacher. Um, granted she was born in like the early 1920s. Um, so I spent out like a lot of time up until like fifth grade and she passed away, but like in some ways feeling raised by her, um, just because, you know, it's a, during a time of my life where I'm most easily molded, I think, as yeah. you're just a kid. And she had a very like scholarly demeanor, you know, being a teacher and just like from a very educational side of my family. And she taught me a lot. I feel like on how to like treat people as much as you could really teach like a eight year old to, you know, but like losing her was very hard on me, I think, because my mom is my mom, but she was still like being my great grandmother, like yeah. another mom, you know? Grandmothers have a different way of nurturing the, the grandkids versus the the parent and the kid. It's a yeah. different, different attachment. You have siblings? I forgot. I do have a sister and uh, two half brothers. Okay. Um, but my sister is nine and a half years on me, so we've never Top really two. been close because when I was 10, she was essentially moved out. Yeah. You know, just kind of just <coughs> been such a gap. Um, we get along today, but like we're not, I don't think, close. Like we mm. don't talk regularly. And that is what it is. I mean, I think partially, again, to the age gap. But, and then my half brother's a similar thing where it's just age gap one, but they're with my dad who lives far from where I live. So I just don't see them. So I haven't really formed yeah. a bond with them. So are you closer with your mom? Yeah. Much definitely. like much closer. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Basically, felt like outside of like my grandparents, she raised me. I mean, I've lived yeah. with her most of my life. I'm um, just kind of, well, similarly, like, I don't really have a relationship with my dad. I mean, it's very much like, like, so he'll, like, visit one, two, three times a year. And, like, when we're together, like, we just talk about kind of, like, the surfacey things, and my dad sort of just assumes that everything's okay. Or he'll just say, like, oh, well, good to see you guys are doing better, you know, just, it's very surfacey. We don't really go into the deep nitty-gritty stuff, but it's still good to, like, see him. But I sort of know like how to interact with my dad now, and I don't need him to be somebody like I. So it's I don't know if you can relate to this, but I when I look back at my childhood, I needed. I needed like a father figure. Like, it would have been nice to have like dad at like the sporting events to encourage me. You know when I was like a mess, you know psychologically on the court and like because I realized this because I had a not to go too much into this, but like so I remember. It was a summer league game that I I played where my my this coach I worked with one on one came and he was just like the whole during the whole game he was just encouraging me like you know talking from the sidelines and I had a I was like a breakout game kind of and I realized like looking at that I was like that's that's really all I needed was this like support or this male figure just like to, pushing to, you to, to, no just to instill that confidence in confidence, me that belief yeah. you know that belief whereas like a mom mom mom's great but like. Moms can't do everything, you know, and especially like the son, the son, yeah, needs their mom, but they also need their dad to provide certain guidance. It's huge. So anyway, like, but now I'm at a point, you know, where I've sort of accepted, like, I don't need my dad to be dad. Like, I could just see him as, like, he's my dad, but he's also just, he's another person, and like, I need to be able to, you know, do these, take care, do these things for myself, essentially, like, and it's, it's, so, you know, it's, it's, it was, it's, it's been really tough, but I think having come out of it, it's like, oh, well, no, this actually can make you stronger. 
that makes sense. Yeah. Like for, cause for a long time I was like, man, I feel so weak. Like I'm like, no resilience and mental toughness. Like, you know, ah, dad didn't instill this. It's for a long time I thought I was just like fucked in that, in that sense. And I was like, damn, I'm gonna, maybe I'll never. Like I've been in some dark, dark places, and I, there was some sometimes where I was like, man, I don't think I'm. Like, am I uh, like I'm a weak man, you know? Or like, yeah. and, now, and then I didn't really see ever see a way of like transcending or being able to like overcome, come this. But like now I'm in a different place, but. I don't know where I'm going with this per se, but um, I think it's just you know, kind of like what you asked me. It's kind of like it's a pivotal part yeah, of your life, develop. but it kind of like <clears throat> develops I remember, you into what. Who well, you it's are interesting today. because like when you're struggling, when you're in a bad place, it's easy to just like look back and just bemoan certain things that happened that were in your control. And I remember certainly feeling like envious of like my friends who had both parents in the household for the whole childhood who were being envious of my friends whose parents were like still married and da 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 but yeah. well, I mean I like, relate just, to that. But there's things that are just like, you know, now I'm at a place where I'm like in a pretty like peaceful, I think for the most part. And it's just like you're learning to accept like, well, you know, you, you couldn't do anything about this. And, like you gotta just deal with the hand you're dealt. Yeah. You know, but <clears throat> I can see how it can definitely tear you apart psychologically because it did I was very torn apart for a long time you know and anyway the, the, my question was, <laughs> was supposed to be initially the question to you was the, the, the like the notable things that stick out to your childhood <laughs> and, I, and I turned it to myself what well, about like I mean <clears throat> like I said like with my grandparents it was just kind of like I feel like it was a lot of it was kind of Negative in a way, where you know it's just like okay, divorced parents, grandparents raised me, grandparent dies, like it was. Those were probably some of the more toughest things that I kind of had to like overcome. Granted, as a young age, like I said, you don't really realize like the significance, but like as you start to like self realize and kind of just figure yourself out, you're just kind of like, dang, that that really impacted me you know i wonder what i would be like had yes I had that, exactly you yeah know? these were conversations i had so many of these conversations with my brother my twin brother about this stuff like because when we were just in bad places mentally we would just be like essentially just victimizing ourselves which you know it, it was just like you know pitting ourselves which is not like it, you have it, it's necessary at times you know because things are just like i, I get it um it's just like, oh, if dad didn't do, mom and dad didn't do this, you know, then we wouldn't have been like this, and the things would have been different. But it's, yeah, it just it is what it is. It's out of your control. Yeah. So what what are what are some like um or what's like a? Well, I actually have two questions, but I'm gonna ask like firstly, what what's um, like what's a positive memory that sticks out to you? <laughs> You're like, okay, think of it. Harder to answer. <laughs> well, so you grew up at in Phelps. Pretty, yeah, pretty they're... like rural area, right? Small town remote kind of i guess um, yeah no, i mean yes i, I small town <clears throat> i'm very lucky to have have found the friends that i did because i think we were all very much different from our peers um none of my friends i was i'm probably was the weirdest of all of them if you think i'm weird that's fair but like i don't think it's a negative thing Right, weird can be good, absolutely, and I, I, I do like the thing, I, I lean on the side of good weird, <laughs> you know, like, I, I don't think I'm like most people, I don't think I'm above anybody because I'm not like most people, I just think I have an interesting upbringing and just the way I see things, and I think in part, Agreed. partly due to, because I came from such a small town surrounded by people I just didn't really <laughs> resonate with, you know, I didn't. It was a very small town thinking, a very like country like vibe. I like hunting. I like working on my tractor. Like it's very <laughs> cliche, sometimes so sounding stereotypical, but like, believe it or not, living in New York State, you wouldn't expect that. But in the area we no, live in, that is see. there. You know that we do have very. Um, you go towards like, like Harley. We played all these teams in like middle of nowhere so like no, they're there probably my school you know it's just like so it gave I mean, me a lot of perspective on what i don't want to be like like it has helped me find yeah. like i don't know so like that's why i also like, want to move to the city because i just yeah. resonated with like city life 
people, <laughs> but people who have different personalities. So it's just like you live up in the city, you'll meet every type of individual. You live in a small town, you meet a lot of the same individuals because it's like that mm. herd mentality where you just kind of like yeah it's a, it's a community thing you know it's a small community so like if if you are the black sheep you're kind of shunned from the community i think i feel like in the suburbs and rochester well, maybe rochester is a spread out enough city where you don't notice where you do notice anyway the, i do think there is kind of a herd mentality still in at least where i grew up in the suburban area and i don't i don't think i've been experienced enough in the city to like really feel it out because I don't think I spent enough time in Rochester, Rochester. City. Yeah. But yeah, having spent some time at like open mic nights, you do see some people are very eccentric in yeah. a sense. And perhaps the city does. <coughs> the city is more representative of like just the diversity in some ways. But I certainly feel like me growing up in the suburbs was, was like that. It was a hurt sort of. Yeah. yeah. Or sort of like a homogenous sort of way of looking at the world or just operating. I guess. But there's nothing necessarily wrong with it per se because it's just like, it's familiar, it's sort of safe in a sense. It is. It's like, well, if you so. do these things, you'll just be on track. Whatever that means. Like, you'll be on. Yeah. Which is comforting for many people, and that's <laughs> fine. Well, it also is interesting because I'm wondering in Phelps too, like, the, the your neighbors and the families that are there, like, maybe they've just been there for generations and generations. Yeah. And, so that culture or whatever that the foundation is so but yeah and and to to veer away from that it's just like you don't even think about it because generation after generation they've just done things a certain way i think it's just like i think for me at least it was coming to realization at a young age that i'm just not like my peers yeah Am it's I not like even a choice. Of, it's not even necessarily a choice. I can't help it. Yeah, it's, it's not yeah, yeah, my this control. was the same thing for me. It was like, it's never really an intentional choice I made. It's just, oh, you're like, one day you're just aware that like, oh, wait, I'm being picked on or, oh, wait, I don't feel like I fit in. And it's just like, yeah. and it's just like, at some point, you, maybe you try for a while to fit in, but then you realize, oh, wait, no, I can't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think, I think I had a very adaptive personality. So like, I never felt like I didn't, I couldn't fit in, yeah. but I knew at the end of the day that my interests weren't fully aligned with my peers, and I made the best of it, and still, like, like, kind of mentioning, had I had a lot of friends in high school, but they weren't close friends, but, like, I could find anybody and, like, be on good terms with them. And I think it was just because I could enjoy, like, I think it was the humor piece for me. I was like, if I can make you laugh, and you weren't a jerk back to me, we're cool. And like, think, it was that simple. Did you like, always have that knack for, like, just being a clown? I don't know. I think it was, if anything, it probably was a coping piece. Oh, reactive. You yeah. know, like, Very it's cool. who I am, but I think... I also just get a lot of pleasure of making people happy. I mean, it feels good. It's, it's worthy. It's, it's a very noble, uh... You know, like... Way. Do I make everyone laugh? Absolutely not. Sometimes it just straight annoys people, and, like, that's out of my control you know mm-hmm. like but then I, I just tone it back i like okay like i'm not gonna try to be funny i think i'm funny i make myself you laugh more funny. than anybody else makes me laugh and like you're funny and subtle very subtle like now you don't try too hard it's funny i remember at work at wegman's when i was working there you just <laughs> it's very subtle like you sort of sneak something like sneak something funny in i'm good at one-liners you <laughs> i like listen to a conversation and like the impulse of thought I'll just think of something that's just like on the, the spot and like yeah. it's left field and like but that's that to me is humorous you know it, like I think what makes things funny are the things you least expect I I definitely like try and be like I definitely a little too sarcastic at times which I need to be very mindful of during work because <laughs> it can backfire I I don't think, like, I try to, like, be funny, but sometimes I try to, I think I sometimes try and be a smartass, like, so, <laughs> last week, one of the interns, um, she was, like, drawing a fireplace, and, um, she was, like, oh, I, I probably can't, oh, I can't recount this verbatim, but she was, like, I don't know, how would you describe this, like, me, like, staring at a fireplace, and I'd just be, like, and I just said, fiery, and then, uh, it doesn't sound funny when I say it, but like one of the other staff members just really got a kick out of that for some reason. Partially, I think it was more delivery. It was just the like the very like 
aloof delivery maybe of it of just like <laughs> maybe that was what made her laugh but yeah see when i say it it, just, it sounds so stupid but, but, but when i said it in the context like apparently she found it really funny <laughs> <laughs> what cracks me up sometimes the most is when I'm not trying to be funny that I make the yeah, person yeah, that yeah. I can't actually make laugh yeah. and makes them laugh yeah. and I'm like that made you laugh but when I'm actually trying it's a complete mess every single time yeah okay maybe <laughs> well, it's fine yeah I have a feeling and I'm like I feel good I'm like oh I got you to laugh still it wasn't intentional but I guess eh. I feel like maybe for me maybe I'm just a little bit just just a bit that awkward enough where it's just like funny yeah you know yeah, humor is weird, you know. I don't think there's enough of. I don't think there's enough humor. I just feel like a way to spread positivity. I, but I realize I don't think there's enough humor. Like in my when I think about work, like none of my coworkers really. Not that they don't have a sense of humor, but they don't. It doesn't seem like they're they're not really like lighthearted. You know, they, you know they they don't go out of their ways. You don't have to go out of your way to crack jokes, but, like. You know, I think it's better sometimes to just not take things so seriously. Because <laughs> you, you can find humor in every situation. Absolutely. Well, probably, actually, the only way you can really do you have to be able to sort of be aware of that first. Yeah. And just be like, oh, there's something weird about this. That is, it's a normal thing that we've all accepted. Like, you know, we all we all go to our jobs or whatever. We, for example, we go to our jobs with a professional, professional mask, and, you know. But you can, you can just take that mask off every once in a while, you know. Um, yeah. That's also, I noticed at work too, it's like, there's times where I'm just trying to like joke around and it just, people take me serious. Like they think I'm being serious and then I'm like, I have to kind of like remind myself, take a step back and I'm like, they don't, they don't really know me. Yeah. Like they don't know yeah. me enough where they like, they, they see that I'm not being serious. So sometimes I like, and it's, it's not really funny, but I. I humor myself where I'm like, you know, I walk up to a coworker and I'd be like, I'll just like kind of like harshly say their name, like Ryan. And they'll like look at me and I'm just like, how's your day been? You know, <laughs> like I just very calmly just like, and like just go on to a normal conversation. And like, I'm, I guess I'm just humoring myself. And usually yeah, it makes them laugh too because they're just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. what? Like, am I in trouble? Like, no, you're fine. I mean, everything's cool. Like, and, yeah, I, and yeah, I try yeah. to be reassuring in that regard. Like, I've never tried to, like, make somebody feel like they're in trouble and then, like, leave them empty-handed. Like, I, yeah. that's important to me. Like, I'm not trying to, like, mess with your head. Like, to a point where you're just, like, walking away from that, like, second-guessing yourself. Like, I, I, I always make it a point to, like, clear the air and just be like, just, I just want, like, especially, like, at the end of a conversation, like, Hey, earlier when I did this, like, just want you to, like, I wasn't, I wasn't serious, yeah. like, because that's important, too. I don't want to make somebody feel bad of just to humor yeah, myself. Yeah. Like, that's no. not funny. That's just being whatever, but, like. I realize I do that, too. I, I, I sometimes just, like, want to mess with someone to humor myself. I'll be like, hey, uh, I'll be like, hey, Andrew. Hi. <laughs> you know, just Literally, like, just like... you know, it's stupid, but, yeah. like, sometimes it's the stupid that makes, you know, whatever, you know. Uh, sometimes I just completely miss the miss the nail, and I'm like, that's fine, you know. That's yeah, me too. I'm like, and then I overanalyze. It. I'm like, oh shoot, did I see that wrong? No, did she interpret it this right, way? Right, right. Do you feel Do you feel satisfied um with where you're at um, professionally? Like, do you do you? I know you you like your job enough, obviously, because you're there. And you have There's a, a level of satisfaction. I think it's just because now that I like promoted once again into another position of power that I'm like finding that like I, it's like oh I, I can do this or like oh I am respected to this level and like that is a satisfying feeling that I am able to like provide a service to my team that is useful you know like there's nothing that I find more satisfying than somebody coming to me with a question or a problem dilemma or whatever and on the fly I can deliver mm -hmm. whatever they need like that is so fulfilling for me mm -hmm. so like it still is like would I love to make more money could I probably do something bigger or better probably but like I'm not self-driven by that desire alone that I want to just keep like jumping ship to something yeah. bigger and greater like I am finding enough 
self satisfaction in mm-hmm. what I do. That's good. I like the environment. I like. Mm-hmm. I like being in a bakery. I I like just the chaos that comes with it, the million different moving parts. I feel like it keeps me on my toes. It challenges me. Um, it's probably for us one of the hardest areas to work in, and like for what it is. Obviously, every job comes with its own challenges, but like I think people really underestimate like what goes on, especially like what you were used to. At, like Fairport is nothing like what I'm experiencing now. It's just like, once you scale it to a larger setting, it really like can be a lot, like a lot. But being able to kind of like rise above and like handle that, it's really satisfying. And having such a large team of individuals who all have unique needs and being able to like Mm -hmm. please all of them to, to some degree. I mean, you can't please everybody, but like, I feel like I'm doing a good job at being a leader when I can please the majority and not the minority. If I'm able to cater to a few individuals and make their life better, like that's great. But if I can't create that mass appeal, then I think I'm failing in my position. I don't feel like I'm failing in my position because I do believe that I have that mass appeal. And I'm finding that... <laughs> no. But like I, yeah. you, you receive that validation that because is. I've been in a lot of, I've been a part of many teams, mm-hmm. and it's a reoccurring theme where I find that I'm generally well received by the masses. Do I still find ways to annoy the masses in certain things I do? Absolutely, I'm not perfect, but it's just the same <laughs> way that like. Everybody on my team isn't perfect, and they all have their quirks, certain areas that they fall short in, just as much as I have certain areas I fall short in. But, like, at the end of the day, if I can create an environment where you're happy to come to work and, like, know, like, oh, I'm working with that individual or that individual being myself, like, then I'm, I think I'm doing an okay job. But if you're coming to work and you're dreading the fact that Daniel's your boss today, that's something that I obviously, when I, I would hope... I could find that out and like what do I need to do to improve? You sound like a very competent leader. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, that, that sounds like Yeah. No, I think you definitely are. I mean <laughs> the funny thing at Fairport when we were at Fairport Road was with Keith and I were we were we were, we were talking. We were like, Man just seems he seems so lax. He's like if if there was if there was like uh, weakness is that he's too chill. <laughs> like, he's so chill. I've been told that. <laughs> I, did, I am too chill, but like... But I think, no, but just, I, don't, I don't actually think that was a... Because at Fairport, it was so... I Because I, I, I can almost bet my life on the fact that you're not this way at Candeva because it's just a totally different... It's a different environment. It's a different beast. I can't even, whereas at Fairport Road, like, I was super relaxed. Too. Like, I was, I'm just eating, you know, I'm eating while I'm working. Because, like, it's just, there's no real, well, yes, there's still a lot of stuff to put out. But it's, it's very, not like a huge sense but, of urgency. Yeah, there's not a sense of, exactly. You know. Whereas, like, you, yeah, and so you sort of just, you adapted yourself to the pace of that store. But I bet at Canadago, you're not what you are at Fairport. Like, you're, because you're, you can't, because you got to meet all these it's demands. Like, yeah, 50-50. I, on the slower days, that's like, let's chill, like, let's have fun, whatever. And then, like, when the going gets tough, it's just, like, it flicks a switch in my brain, and it's just, like, we got to deliver. And that's where you'll see me just <clears throat> all over the place. Not, I'll, I'll talk, of course, like, but, like, you, I feel more like an orchestrator, and I feel like I can be a good orchestrator where it's just, like, you know, I'm I'm in a position where I'm expected to see the bigger picture and like so like I'm constantly looking at like where are the loose ends, how can I fill the void or how can I get somebody to flex out of their comfort to help me fill the mm-hmm. void and it's just like understanding people's strengths, weaknesses, how do you bring a team together to accomplish whatever you're set out to do mm-hmm. and like I kinda dig well you, you have to. Absolutely, and I and I still haven't seen like how crazy it can get. Cause come summertime, all the 
multimillionaire people who all moved down back to their lake houses, like they're coming and they have very high standards and they expect you to bend over backwards for them. And it's just like, I haven't gotten to see that yet. And I have to understand, like, I'm going to be catering to a, a very specific clientele, which I'm not scared of that. Like I, I, I do I think I do phenomenal with customers. Like it's yeah. really easy to to schmooze somebody. Like that yeah. part feels natural. So like I'm not nervous about that, but it comes with like the intensity of like the workflow is definitely gonna jump a level. But like yesterday, you know, it's just me, the whole team, it's a Sunday, it's busy, and it's just like I felt like a ping pong ball. It's just like I'm on one end of the department helping so and so because they're behind all right, I feel like you're good. It's just, uh, I'm on the other end of the apartment. It's just like, okay, we got to get these cakes decorated. We got to get the patisserie case going, get those fruit tarts looking good, you know, placing all the fruits. And it's just like Jeez. being it's able exhausting. to like, but all of those individuals, they're so tunnel visioned into their job. Like, so they're not seeing that so-and-so on the other end struggling. And if they are, they don't give a, they, they, can't. they don't care. So they got their own thing to do. So it's like, robot. No, it <laughs> feels like that sometimes. So it's just like, well, it's a very, um, a word for this but like the whole operation there's many parts that need to just be it's just constantly moving and then it's just like being able to respond to emails and just like the logistical end of it like i still have to manage that on top of it so it's just like it's a lot on your plate a lot of i don't take breaks i took my lunch 15 minutes before i'm supposed to technically go home so obviously my lunch extends beyond the time i'm supposed to be there to and like I still come back from my lunch and I still have to wrap things up and it's just like it's a time management thing and like that's an area I can always improve on. It's just like how could I get to a point where I'm not doing that? But like that's just a part of learning the ropes and being in a new environment and like held to a higher standard. It's like really interesting the way I'm treated. Like it's not like I didn't feel like I had anyone's respect where we work, but like just so much more relaxed. That, yeah, but now I'm in an environment where, like, everyone looks up to me and they treat me like I'm important. And it's really cool because, like, I'm not used to that, per se. You are important. <laughs> but I guess, like, I am important. And it's just, like, I'm more involved and more, like, higher up. In the decision-making process. Yeah, absolutely. And that's really cool. I really enjoy that. Um, I feel like I have an opinion that matters and, like, when I vocalize an opinion, like I'm trusted on it, and like I feel like I've kind of established mm. and earned the trust of the f yeah. my coworkers. Mm. It's really interesting, and like I'm I'm getting used to that, but it's really like it makes my job more fun for me. You know, I don't think I have all the answers. I'm still learning. Like I don't, you know, but like I like that I get to learn from my team, and like give my own learnings and pass on to them and it's just really interesting how you get used to doing the same routine but every routine at every location you kind of get blocked at is different so like I can bring those skills from past experiences forward and then like they bring their own skills to me that I'm like you know I've been doing this for so many years and I didn't still didn't know we could do it like that and it's really cool do you ever see yourself I mean, I guess it's looking kind of ahead. Do you ever see yourself pivoting into a different field? Could you ever see yourself pivoting into a different field, and what would that be? I still want... You know, some people, like, they well, they're, like, they work at, for, they're at Wegmans, and they just know, like, yep, this is it. This will be here for the... For this I don't want to believe that that is it for me. What? Is there a certain I'm field at, or field that... I'm at a point that, where I'm, like, more I'm... I've, at a point in my career there that I, I am comfortable enough to stay, knowing that, like, I'll be okay. But I do believe that I'm destined for more. I've had a lot of friends and partners over the years who have believed that for me as well. Like, they see something that, like, I don't always see, but, like, I kind of see it. But, like, I, I think I'm it's a, a being afraid to take the leap to what feels like the unknown. Is the unknown, yeah. So, like, I still, like, parts of my life thought I would be really good working with, like, children, like, like in a psychological way, like, you know, in the, 
a social science field, I guess, better way to put it. So like there was a time where I really felt passionate about like getting into cognitive behavioral therapy, working with children. More particularly, I wanted to work with children who come from really bad environments or, you know, environments where they're not given the resources that they, they need, you know, like I have a soft spot for that. And I guess maybe that stems from the fact that I came from a divorcee household and just like felt like I was neglected of resources. Kind of like you said, it's just like that push from a father figure to like instill that confidence and just kind of like nudge you forward to be your best self. And like, yeah. that's the most crucial time of our lives, I feel like, is that an adolescence where we need that. I do think, it is, I don't know if it's the, it is obviously very crucial in the sense that, yeah, a lot of those. You can discover these things shape. beyond adolescence. Right, but, you know, a lot, a lot of people talk about, like, when you kind of transition to adulthood, there's a lot of unlearning. Yeah, also true. That needs to happen. Um. So in some ways, I guess the beauty of quote unquote adulthood and independence is like discovering for yourself what what really matters to you or who you need to become to be the best version of you. You know what I mean? It's a kind of cliche yeah. in some ways. Um because inevitably even if let's like, say you came from a very stable household and like two loving parents, you still have challenges. And like yeah. I have a friend yeah. from high school who Christian family. I don't know if the Christian thing has anything to do with it, but like both fam both parents were married, you know, in the house. You know, and he followed a very conventional route, like he um very smart academic person, like straight A student, I'm assuming, you know, went to a good college, you know, did a four plus one bachelor's master's program, works at been working at the same bank since he got an undergrad and been promoted multiple times now, makes six figures. But his life is <clears throat> not perfect by any means. I mean he has he's checked a lot of the boxes. He's, he got six figures salary, you know, he's got his own place. You know, but his life's not perfect. Yeah. And yeah, I guess what you know, you just make with the hand you try to just play the the hand that you're dealt the best you can. It's all you can do. Yeah. And the world is in such a weird spot i guess the world always has been historically you know there's really i think we're always in flux in a sense yeah and everyone's upbringing is different obviously so like yeah you grow up in a conventional household and you still don't turn out perfect whatever that may mean it's just like so many variables you know but yeah i guess kind of the, like what you said though it's just like do i see something beyond what i do now it's like i think I, it just, for me, would have to be, like, involve having an impact on somebody, other people's lives. In a different sense, where it's not, like, customer service, it's more of, a, like, a, like you said, the psychological, like, a, it's a little bit of a deeper connect. I just want to be able to help people. I don't want to be able to, like, say, like, I changed you, you know? I don't know if that is, you know, I'm not looking for that, like, control or something. It's just, like... Feel I feel like we're, we're obviously we're, we're social beings and like there are a lot of people I think especially now in America who are very isolated are isolating themselves and I mean, like yeah I have people in my life who are yeah. and it's really hard to, to crawl out of that and it becomes yeah. so natural at, up to a point like that misery yeah. you kind of like surround yourself in that like some people are under the mindset it's like it's on you to pull yourself up and out of it but like i think it gets to the point where it's such a vicious cycle that like not everyone just has the, the capacity to do that or they might have necessarily the capacity but like <laughs> clearly aren't doing it and i guess it's not my job to make them do it but like i think it's sometimes i want to be like that voice of the reason to be like you know you you can be happier I'm not, it's not up to me to make you happier, yeah. but like, I guess it would start with asking that question. Are you happy and are you comfortable being who you are right now? Which I would assume in, in maybe in the setting that I'm envisioning, it's like that person's not. 
And I would hope or think that they would then say, you know, I'm not, I'm not happy being unhappy. And then it's like, okay, well, what can we do to like bring you to peace? You don't need to be a happy individual outright, but like, I don't think it's good to be miserable all the time or just like in a depressive state. Like it's not, it's not a fulfilling life, I believe. It's hard. Like I'm at a state where I'm doing okay and it's hard to see a, certain people in my life kind of making the same mistakes or going in circles but then I also step back and realize I was once in that place where like you know you're miserable but in, in an odd way it's it's comforting because it's familiar yeah and it's also I wish I had the words to describe it because it becomes such a habit and there's you almost no longer you're not really miserable anymore because it's just your baseline yeah in some ways it's just and then like but there are a lot of things going on because like your decision made like for me I, I remember moments when i was just the lowest like just making decisions was incredibly difficult and you're just overthinking everything like you're essentially thinking yourself to paralysis mm -hmm. you're just and eventually you do have to be the one that pulls yourself out. Like I have had, I've had you know, supportive people and you need to call people up, but eventually like, I don't know if you do all the work or sometimes it's just it's like timing, like certain things just like, you maybe you don't see it at the time, but like there's certain things that push you forward that maybe has nothing to do with you. Like maybe it's just time. That's all happening. It's, it's, it's weird because some, when you're in that cycle, vicious cycle of just whatever depressive depression or whatever there seems like there literally seems there is no light at the end of the tunnel like it feels like there's no way i'm ever gonna get out of this i'm doomed like like woe is me like and you regret you're dwelling in the past you're like fuck this didn't happen like you know or how am i gonna ever you know do this and just the anxiety it's just overwhelming you to the point of just like indecision you're like oh no i'm not gonna do anything because it's just every everything is too much i was a point in my teenage life going into like early 20s where like i for like i felt like a year straight where i like it wasn't working i had just graduated high school like it wasn't at the time choosing to like go to college or anything like that and I literally like laid in bed all day every day I would scroll on my phone do the bare minimum and just essentially like self-depreciate like I just was like just, just grumbling <laughs> surviving like letting my mom take care of me and like let her take care of the bare minimum necessities that keeps me alive, but like just doing nothing for myself, just laying in bed, wake up, scroll, you know, use the bathroom, the bare minimum to like whatever, yeah. just shower, but like go back, then go right back to my bedroom and like there. live out my day I've been there. every freaking yeah. day. And like, I don't, I don't know what got me out of it. I think kind of is like a lot of different things and I think there was a point where I kind of like self-motivated myself to the just to the level of where I was like you know what I can be independent and like do things by myself so I like would just like go out to eat alone yeah. which at the time I thought prior to like really doing it I was like that's a weird thing to do interestingly I people people say that like eating oh you're eating alone oh but i never thought it was i mean because people think oh he's no friends or he's eating alone I right never thought it was whatever like, i think it's a kind of a cool thing well it, it, you can go to a restaurant by yourself and just i eat started to do that and it became like invigorating yeah, like, like it was just like, was like yeah, liberating whatever it was just like this like i can go out and see the world like on my own i can just see things and like i started to do that and I then started to kind of like reach out to my friends more and like make an effort to like start hanging out with them again more and not as in, you know infrequently as I did and I think that helped me immensely. 
I think I just felt so directionless at that time in my life that I just was like, yeah, don't have any motivation to do anything. I don't think I could be anything. And like, you just, I don't know. And I, and then, and it was a vicious cycle. I got very comfortable in that. And I, I don't know what was like the pivotal moment for me, but I'm very thankful. Like I, I found whatever it was that got me to break yeah. loose, you know? Um, Cause yeah, you get really absorbed in it and it's just like, woe is me every day. Just nothing to look forward to. I'll never amount to anything. Like it's just very toxic. You know, you just like, you got a little virus in you, a little whatever, you know, you just, but I'm glad I, you know, I, I don't think I'm anything like that now. And it's just like, I think I even told you about the time where I like basically went to New York City, stayed with, uh, you know, it's one of a good friend of mine's now ex-girlfriend, but like she gave me like her apartment in oh, yes. East Village or whatever to mm -hmm. like just use it like as a space. Like she still had a job, so it's like she wasn't there to hang out with me. She's just like, here's our spare key, come and go as you want. And I was there for like the weekend and like everything I for the most part did was independent and like that was for me like an insanely like aw like liberating like I just felt like free like that was just so awesome for me that was my first time in New York City so like you know you only have what you know movies show you or what you hear and like I spent it all in Manhattan but like just being able to go wherever I wanted to no responsibilities the only thing that could hold me back was the money in my pocket type thing but like i wasn't choosing to spend it all i was just like oh i want to go to you know it's the morning i want to go have a bagel where's the closest bagel place around me oh shit i got like 15 of them within like a mile of me what well, has a good review okay i'll go there and i i'll have and i just have like the best breakfast sandwich yeah. ever and i'm like can't wait to do that all over again the next day you know like go to NYU, sit in, like, the little, like... Washington Square Park. <laughs> yeah, and laugh somebody just jam on a piano. It was, it was incredible. Love that. And, like... Yeah, New York is a beast. And this was around the time where I was still at a... Closer to a low point in my life. So, like, I think that was a contributor to kind of, like... <coughs> you, know, you get to see, like, that there's more to life type thing. Or it's just, yeah, like, yeah. you know, New York City is so full of life because you're surrounded by millions of people. It's crazy, but like if you're in a small town outside, just coming in to visit, well, like if, if you have like the space to like accept and embrace it, which I definitely did, like it was awesome. Yeah, it probably showed you that you were um you're very receptive for city life. There's more. There's just more out there. Yeah, because you, know? you probably came from not a sheltered place, but just a very. I felt it, you know, you want to go out like to, you got to drive 20, yeah, 30 yeah. minutes. But then you go into, like, the other, so you're on one extreme here, and New York City is here, and you're just like, oh my god, it's a totally different way of it's life. Like, everything's at my here. fingertips. Just, uh, people, so many, just overstimuli, you know. But I, I love that, overload. you know, like, that's yeah, the thing, I love you, the stimuli. Because you came from a place with no stimuli. Yeah, I'm going to be my own stimuli, yeah. that's why I, like, was Then everything the was just there for you, you didn't have to make any effort yeah. in New York, it's just there, and you just... Anywhere, it's like you're like, you know, Katie's or whatever. Yeah. Walk a direction, and you're gonna yeah, and see a million you like. things. Yeah, see a million crazy people. I remember, like, I got in late at night off the bus. Friend that I was staying with, she came and like picked me up, get back to the apartment, and I just kind of like must have made some sort of comment that suggested I was hungry. And I had already like changed into my pajamas and all of this, like, I was pretty much ready for bed. Or I think she was just like, I think she just asked me, like, Are you hungry? and I was like. Yeah, but like, don't worry about it. Like, I don't. And she's like, no, wait, I got like a dollar pizza spot right around the corner. You want to go? And I'm like, well, I'm in my pajamas. She's like, it's New York City. Nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? Yeah. And sure enough, it like literally like flip flops, pajamas, like everything I would not want to like look like out in public. And just like, and I, that made me feel like free. And like, it's nobody true. like even looks at you. Because New York City. You're just you're a just nobody. To... You're just. Well. When you're in New York City, if you're especially if you're in New Yorker, like you've been there, like you you're so used to seeing people from you've seen the it whole, all. You've seen, you've seen it all. Worse, yeah, you know? like, it's I, just like I, that's nothing. Like you in pajamas, yeah. that's nothing. You know, yeah, like I remember living there, and yeah, you see just the whole spectrum of people. You essentially become numb, desensitized to the just 
the diversity. <laughs> the truly... Because in New York, everyone's just, like, you just tune it out because... You're just your own... It's for the best. You're a car on the sidewalk just driving yeah. to a location, like, you're just looking out for yourself when yeah. that's it. And, yeah, that's a cool experience, though. I'd love to go back and, like, do that all over again, but now because of, like, just a job and responsibilities. it's expensive, responsibilities, things like that, I don't think I'd have that same level of, like, feeling free, you know, as, well, as free as I felt you can use PTL for it or whatever your vacation right. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Which I have plenty of it. I haven't used any yet, so. Nice. All right, so I'm going to start to wrap this up, so I have one more question to ask you, which... Yeah. So I stole this. So when I was at, I think 2021, 22. So Brandon Stanton, have you heard of this guy? He's Humans of New York. Have you heard of Humans of New York? Oh, like the, the guy uh, who took he photos, takes pictures, and then yeah, like so, so yeah, Brandon yeah, yeah, Stanton yeah. is the guy in uh, who's who runs that, and he came to Penn State to speak a couple times. But this was in 2021 where I saw him, and he was essentially telling the audience like, well, these are the questions I ask the people I interview, and so I wanted to ask you this question I stole from him. So, what, in a question is, what is one challenge, what's the challenge you're going through right now? It doesn't have to be the biggest challenge, but what is the challenge that you're navigating? Um, I guess being really truthful is just being more responsible for myself and my surroundings. Okay. Um, you know, just like, it's like that, that constant feeling of like never having your shit together, whether you do or you don't. Like I, I, I never feel like, I just always feel like I could be doing more or doing better for myself. And I don't think I've ever really felt fully satisfied like you know I touched on it earlier it's just like yeah I'm not depressed really I have my moments I think we all do or not you know not, not every day is gonna be a great day um but I, I I'm still not fully self-fulfilled I feel like I'm doing enough to get by day to day where I'm not miserable mm -hmm. but I still am always in a constant state of feeling like I could always be doing more whether that's through being more tidy um cooking for myself more often, not eating out as much, which I, I don't think I do too much, but like, I feel like I could always do, be doing more for myself and others. Like I just, I've never, I'm never feeling satisfied. So I'm always feeling challenged that I, I could just, I guess we feel more put together. Do you feel like doing those things would make you feel more fulfilled? I would hope. Like if you, you know, so, so are those like, the main things that you feel like? That feels like it's, it's a constant challenge in my life. It's just like, could I be more than who I am today? I hate to believe that, yeah, probably. Like, do I have the potential and the capacity to, to make more money, have a house right now? Like, these are things I want. I don't feel, like, consumed by it. You know, like it, like I said, it does. I don't feel like I'm not miserable, but like, you know, it's that that outside pressure of like you, you could always do more, you could always have more. It's like when you see your peers own houses still or get married, have kids. Like it's not like I really want to get married or have kids, but it's just like you know, you, you still feel like forced into that rat race feeling of just like mm. okay, well, this is where I'm gauging myself mm. based on where my peers are. And now I'm seeing people who are years younger than me who already have all that, and I mm. still don't. You know, like, it doesn't always feel good, you know, seeing, like, a 24, 25-year-old who owns their own house, but it's, like, whatever hand they were dealt in life got them there. And, like, whether that was because they were so self-motivated, self-driven, mm -hmm. or because they had external factors, hit it big on Bitcoin, had parents who were overly supportive, had came from, you know, better financial stability. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of reasons. And, like, so I try to mm -hmm. remind myself that, like, yeah, I don't know what they went through right. and you what also, got on there. You also don't know what they are going through. You don't know I if don't they're know. actually so satisfied with That's why I don't let myself get too miserable yeah. on the fact. But I still can't help but 
acknowledge where my peers are Mm -hmm. and those around me so like it makes me yearn for more i guess if that makes any sense like i have friends who are able to like vacation freely and like i i don't have that privilege would you like that i would Mm -hmm. you know i like to mention i've I've lived in europe for a couple summers like i got to see a lot so like i've seen parts of the world that I'll never forget and like have really impacted me you know so like I miss that you know I miss having that opportunity and while like I could afford to go on one of those vacations at the same time I don't want to then have no money you know like it's Mm -hmm. just like could I do it sure but then would I basically be like in a paycheck to paycheck situation also Mm -hmm. probably and like I don't want to be like that like I want to feel like I can absorb an emergency so like I don't ever feel like I'm getting far enough ahead. I'm just kind of, like, plateaued. Like, I'm just getting by fine, but I'm not going beyond the getting by part. Mm -hmm. And I think money is the main restriction in that. So, like, uh, you know, I I, I think I could do something more to make money, but, like, I I have just too much self-doubt. So I'm trying to challenge myself to, like, find the courage to pursue higher career choice also means more money but i think it's that fear of failure that is continuously holding me back okay the fear of failure is there but is there like uh something that's glaringly like an option like oh i want to try this or is it sort of just like i have too many options i don't know which one to go with i could be interested in this 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 i don't know I don't think no, anything interests so, me well, enough. Well, and the things not, that maybe, do so interest maybe me, not, I don't think I'm qualified to do. Well, so maybe it's not all just a... Okay, well, so like what? Are those, like the psychological field? Well, what are they doing? Like, sure, I'm not, what, I don't have a what, master's, PhD, what are neither, and I don't think I want that. Like, I don't think I want to go through yeah. that to get there. Well, so, like, the that's my own problem. Well, what are some of the... Well, we don't have to get too deep into it, but, like, what are some of the other interests? Well, like, music. I'm not musically talent i can't play an instrument i can learn it yes but like i feel like a lot of success is found at a young age where you just you've kind of mastered your instrument like well, that's that's strange. a journey too and yes could i achieve that by age 40 probably well, if i put my mind to it mm. but that's not realistic like i don't well, I'm, it's not like me saying like i'm gonna be i want to be a famous artist i'm gonna be a famous mm-hmm. artist like it's a lot of luck a lot of you yeah. know that you know that so like yeah, well, I think you have to do something that, er, like, right now you have your main gig at Wegmans, and then, like, let's say you're looking for some, some activity to pick up. Well, ultimately, you do have to, for you to know that it's a worthwhile activity, obviously, there has to be some intrinsic motivation. Like, like forget, let's forget, like, the money or just whatever. But, obviously, like, your interest is the thing that's going to have to lead the way. Yeah. So like obviously like I I've known you for I don't know I know you like well ish but I I haven't known you for a long time but obviously it's pretty I think it's pretty clear that outside of like music's probably your primary interest it seems yeah feels like it and it feels like listening to music well, my primary yeah interest, so right? that I think we talked about this like listen okay but this music is like in 2024 24 there is definitely something you could do with that. Like, I don't know off the top of my head right now like what all the options are, but there is a way. Social media has absolutely there, created a platform. There is that. a way for you to to do something with it, yeah. and obviously, like if you you will have to be prepared. Like if you were to ever like start something, you will obviously have to be prepared for it to to start slow and not. You're not gonna have like an instant just buzz. You never know. You could there could be an instant hit, but you'd have to enjoy it enough where you didn't care. You know about whether or not other people. Receptive to it or not, basically but. not caring yeah about poor reception or failing you just well i do, do think it. i think that's the thing that stops a lot of people like for example i have a friend who was always talking about starting up this podcast like oh i think i'd be so good at a podcast and we were like as his friends like his other friends would say too yeah you'd be great at starting a podcast but then he's, he's like okay i'm gonna do it and then nope it's like that fear of like, what do other people think of me oh i don't look good oh i mm, this doubt but it's like sometimes you gotta do it because people don't really care. <laughs> like, yeah. people don't. And if they do, they do, but like it doesn't. But they don't. Really, they won't they're be your into, audience. Right. Like, that's and, they're, it, and, they're, you know? and they're too into their own, like, to really have a stake in, unless you're like your family or like, really, really close friends. This is the one thing I think like a lot of people have creative potential that they're just not tapping into because maybe it just doesn't fit with the 
the middle of the street sort of path or they're afraid of like other people's judgment or something but it's hard for me that i need to also like realize like i'm not in their shoes so i don't know what they're going through like all i know is for me personally my experience with like when someone's writing songs i just realized like i sort of just needed to do it because i all this pent up stuff that i just needed to, i needed an outlet and i got lucky and i found like oh songwriting was a great productive outlet for me to just dump my feelings you know yeah but everyone's different yeah i know this is very true everyone's different and like it it's also okay i realize like it's okay if like for example for me like i'm somebody who like, i never really felt like i like fit in with the norm so like i feel so i like like i gravitate towards people who like do creative things or like but i also realize like, it's okay if you never if somebody never like it's okay if my friend never does the podcast like it's okay that he you know went to law school and wants to be a lawyer and like that's the only thing he's really focused on like it's okay <laughs> like it's not because it's, it's one it's, it's not my life yeah. and two it's just like he doesn't need to live by anybody else's point of view or like approval he just needs to just it's his life he is free to sort of do whatever he wants with it and it's just like and whatever fulfillment. And whatever comes comes like he has to just dis- he has to discover for himself yeah and he has to live with the consequences positive and negative of decisions or decisions he doesn't make you know and it's it's like okay right I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> that makes sense, yeah. But yeah, it's just tough. Yeah, there's a lot of noise in the world and in our heads that sometimes obscures, like, the pure... Clouds sort of, our judgment, I guess, in some Like, some like the core of, like, like, for example, like, when you were really young, like, what did you really... Before you were super self-conscious, self like, what did you really realize like, the choice? And there's a lot of people talk about, like, like... I've, I've heard like people give advice like oh if you're feeling stuff you just think back to like when you were younger what you gravitate towards and stuff like that but nobody really knows like the search is very confusing we're all searching so maybe some maybe yeah, yeah maybe some, some people I don't think some, no, 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 some people are like nope nah, I don't even want to look. some people some people never ask the questions yeah well that's also I think a lot of people don't ask the questions that's the ignorance is bliss part you know yeah but maybe it's not always willful ignorance. Maybe it's just for whatever reason they just never had to, or it just never occurred it, to them. Yeah, you never. Because yeah, like you maybe they, to. you know, your parents or your, your people surrounding you, like your community, and it, just they just didn't. They have an influence on you. So like everyone's story is different. I think like society. I don't know. Not to keep rambling, but there is a sort of order or stability that happens, right? Like, if you had too many people just, like, always questioning, like, trying to, like, push against the grade, like, it'd be very unstable, you know? Yeah. So maybe, like, you need a chunk of people to just be like, yeah, we're going to do things how they've always been done because this creates the stability. <laughs> but then, like, the people who, like, the change makers aren't usually those people, which is a paradox in some ways. Because we're, we're told to, like, you can be anything. You can be anybody. You can change the world. But then at the same time, no. Like fit in a it's like all those you're... posters in school. You miss all the shots you don't take. <laughs> but it's like no, follow this route because <laughs> you know because it's secure. Or whatever. I don't know. All right, this was fun. I think yeah. this was. I think this is longer than the other two Sorry, guys. I just wanted to jump scare them. <laughs> but all right, it's uh, good. I appreciate you for being on this. No, no. I was glad I got to squeeze you in because I was sick two weeks ago. Yeah. And then I was thinking, oh, maybe I won't be able to do this because I'm so busy and stuff, and like maybe. We won't, both of us won't really want to do this anymore, really, but I'm glad. I'm glad that it worked out. Um, I mean, really fair game. Yeah. I mean, it was work dependent, but like, even after work, it's usually not an issue. So, no, cool. I appreciate it. Thank nice. you. All right, I'm going to press stop. I guess I think that went to at least two hours. I'm curious. It just wasn't recording.